Well, again, thank you for joining us tonight, everyone. We're so glad to have you here and hope that this program will be um, a good one for you and help you out with your landscapes. So I just wanted to mention so that there is a, a, a PDF of this presentation, which you can find online if you want to download it and follow along tonight or if you want to access it later. But you can find it at go.unl.edu slash evergreens. Um, so you could refer to it in the future if you'd like to. All right. So just real briefly, I just wanted to go over what kinds of evergreens we're going to be talking about tonight. And so this this program is primarily on trees, um, ever conifers and evergreens that are tree forms. So, you know, common uh, plants that fall into that group would be arborvitae. We've got some of our firs, the concolor Douglas. We've got juniper, you know, eastern, the June, eastern red cedar for windbreaks and then the, the more ornamental cultivars for landscapes. Then we've got our pines and our spruces, okay? Um, of course, we do have some evergreen shrubs in the landscapes. And so some of these problems we're going to talk about tonight do translate into some of our evergreen shrubs, uh, uh, it, particularly the arborvitae shrub forms, um, some of the juniper shrubs forms, the, the mucal pine, which is a, a pine shrub form. So um, uh, those are the plants that we're going to primarily be talking about tonight. OK, and this picture that you're seeing here of this arborvitae, uh, we're seeing a lot of this kind of thing. And unfortunately, we see a lot of this on arborvitae um, pretty regularly. Um, but this is winter desiccation. This is this is an evergreen that is more adapted to a wetter um, climate with more consistent soil moisture throughout the year. Uh, this is a plant that was losing too much water during the winter. And so basically these tissues just desiccated. They just dried out and died. Okay. I wanted to focus in just for a minute here on one of our spruces because um, Colorado spruce is one of the evergreens that is just used so widely. And we see as people were losing um, scotch pines to pine wilt over the last you know, 10, 15 years, a lot of those trees have been replaced with Colorado spruce. Um, so I just wanted to take a quick look. Okay, where is Colorado spruce adapted? All right, so you, you can see on the map here, um, this scattered range where Colorado spruce is native. And you'll notice that none of these, this tree is not native to Nebraska at all. It's, it's native to the Western states, um, up in the rocky uh, areas, the, the mountainous areas of those regions. So annual precipitation in the areas where Colorado spruce is adapted is between 18 to 24 inches. Um, elevation it can range anywhere from uh, 5,800 feet to 9,800 feet above sea level. So what do they experience here in Nebraska? Well, we have higher annual rainfall in eastern Nebraska, and you can see on the rainfall map below, on the eastern, very eastern part of the state, we're usually somewhere between 30 to 35 inches. And then you go all the way to the western part of the state, and we're down into that 15 to 20 inch range, which is a little more um, consistent with where Colorado spruce is regularly or is, is native, is grown. But the eastern part of the state, you know, that's quite a bit more rainfall than typically Colorado spruce would get, okay? So that's a factor. We do have to keep that in mind. And we're going to talk a lot about drought tonight because drought is playing into some of the problems that we're seeing. But we also run into areas where Colorado spruce is overwatered and it, it's, it's getting way more um, irrigation than that area, that range of precipitation in areas where it's native, and that can cause some serious problems. Then also look at the elevation for Nebraska. So the elevation from the southeast corner of the state is about 840 feet above sea level, all the way out to the west in Promontory Point, which is the highest part of our state at 5,424 feet above sea level. So on average, the the um, elevation for Nebraska is around 2,600 feet above sea level. So you might ask yourself, well, why, why does that matter? Why do I even need to know that? Well, when you're at lower elevation levels, um, some of the weather conditions that come into play frequently are higher humidity levels and hotter temperatures at night. Um, and that is something that Colorado spruce is not well adapted to. And so those things can cause trees to become more susceptible to diseases and to not perform as well, okay? And then of course, in our urban areas, our urban landscapes, 
where we have lots of automatic irrigation systems that are running on a regular basis, um, that can be a really serious problem for spruce because homeowners will set those irrigation systems to run so that they can keep their grass looking nice and green, but they're often watering too often and sometimes way too much for what Colorado spruce is adapted to. And these are really important underlying factors that play into the reasons why some trees struggle and don't do well. Okay, so here are some of the problems we're gonna be talking about. And we're gonna start off tonight talking about some abiotic problems, which means these are not, these are not diseases, these are not insects, these are environmental issues or planting issues that play into a tree's overall health. Okay, so we're gonna look at poor site conditions, management issues, some of the things that we do as we take care of our landscapes that may negatively impact trees. We're gonna look at overwatering and drought, look at both sides of the coin, and then we'll look real briefly at herbicide damage, okay? So poor site conditions, what do we mean by that? Well, we're, we're looking at the soil. You know, what is the quality of the soil? Um, Colorado spruce is native to mountainous areas where the soil is rocky um, and not, not necessarily the heavy clays that we have in many parts of Eastern Nebraska. And if you factor into that, um, homes with new construction where you have extremely poor soil that's left behind after the home is built, then you, you start off a, a new tree in that site um, on a really bad foot because it's dealing with this, this, this heavy clay compacted soil. Sometimes it's hard to get a shovel into that soil. And so how, you know, it's, how do you imagine that tree roots can push their, ways, their way into that soil if we have trouble even getting a shovel into it? Um, so what you're seeing on the two pictures here to the, to the right are um, a soil, the number one image is soil where we have poor soil that was never amended or loosened in any way. And you can see that the number of roots in that, uh, that hole have been highlighted with the paint. So you can see the number of roots more clearly. Now on, in picture two, what we have is a soil where the soil was not amended. There was not any, um, uh, there wasn't compost or any other kind of soil amendment added, but the soil was loosened. It was physically loosened to alleviate any compaction. And just to make that, and to break up those heavy uh, clay, um, um, clods uh, to make it easier for the roots to grow in. And you can see it actually makes a pretty dramatic difference um, on, on the number of roots that those plants were able to put out. So addressing soil quality when you have an established landscape can be a challenge, but it can be done. Um, there, are, there are ways to go about it. And sometimes if you have a tree that's really struggling uh, with very poor amounts of growth, stunted, maybe poor needle color, then doing some work to improve your soil may be something that you need to focus on, okay? So a, a few more management issues that we, we run into with evergreens quite commonly. Um, uh, one of them is mower blight. You know, we give it that funny name uh, where people are running into the trunk of a tree with a lawnmower and causing uh, damage to the bark, maybe chipping away large sections of the bark. That's a, a, a very important wound to the tree because it impacts the amount of bark that is um, available for the tree to move water up and down from the roots to the upper part of the tree. So we never wanna have any kind of damage like that to the bark of the trunk. And then planting depth. So the picture that you see on the, um, well, let, let's start with the picture on the, on the left. Um, look at the base of that tree, um, that spruce with the needles on it, and look at the sides of the trunk. The sides of the trunk are going straight down into the ground like the sides of a telephone pole. And that is telling us that that tree is planted too deeply. When a tree is planted at the correct depth in the soil, you should be able to see the trunk come down and then widen out into the root flare. And that should be right at the soil surface, okay? So there's no telling how deep that tree on the left is too deep in the soil. You know, if you look at the tree on the right now, where the tree has been removed from the soil, you can see that that tree was buried too deeply also. Um, and let's see, every marking change on that surveyor spike is about an inch. So that tree was about, that, would, that tree was about eight, nine to 10 inches too deep in the soil. 
And this whole planting depth issue is a huge factor in how well a tree performs over the course of its life. The farther the roots are placed in the soil due to planting depth, um, the less oxygen there is. And if there is not oxygen in the soil for the tree's roots to pull up, then the roots don't grow as well. So you end up with an overall uh, a, a, a poor, uh, less, um, well, what's the word I'm searching for? You just, uh, less of a root system, a, a stunted root system, if you want to think of it that way. It just doesn't grow and expand the way that it should on a well-planted tree. So if you're ever planting a tree, whether it's an evergreen or a deciduous tree, you always want to make sure that that root flare is right at the surface of the soil. Okay, here's a couple of more planting issues that we run into all the time. On the left hand, we've got girdling roots. Uh, you know, roots that started to circle probably originated when this tree was in a container at some point or potentially, um, uh, you know, it, it could have been um, uh, where a tree was brought in bald and burlapped and the sides of the planting hole were slick and so the, that initiated the girdling of the roots. But where those roots are compressing against the trunk, that again is, is eliminating the ability for the tree to move water up and down through that section of the trunk. So it's limiting the tree's overall ability to absorb water from the soil. And a tree with this kind of a situation is going to be much more severely affected by a drought like, like we're having right now than a tree that doesn't have girdling roots because it, this tree on the left doesn't have 100% of its, of its trunk uh, xylem uh, and phloem or the xylem bringing water you know, up from the roots. Now we have a similar situation on the right where we have, but in this case, we have some strapping material that was never removed when this tree was planted. And it's doing the same thing as those girdling roots were doing. It's, it's compressing the trunk, it's um, cutting into the bark, it's, it's eliminating water movement up and down through that trunk. Sometimes when a tree fails, you know, you may go and, and uh, remove the tree. And at that point, you find out that there was something buried in the soil, like this strapping material that was there from the very, the very time the tree was planted. And so it was impacting that tree from the very start. And you didn't know it because it was out of sight underneath the soil. Um, and, and uh, you know, it was, wasn't easy to find. Okay. So those are some management issues and some, some environmental things that play into evergreen problems. Now let's look at these watering issues. So here in these pictures, um, the picture on the number, the number one picture on the left, that spruce tree maybe doesn't seem so bad to you. I mean, you look at the, the lower left-hand corner and it's a little thin, it's a little thin on that lower edge. Um, I can tell you in this particular landscape, there was a group of about five spruces and they all had thinning on the north sides of the tree. It wasn't extremely dramatic, but it was definitely less needles in that, that area. So talking with the homeowner, talking with him about his irrigation system, I found out that he was watering his lawn three times a week for about 20 minutes uh, per zone, pretty much through the whole, gro whole growing season. So from June through you know, the into September or beyond. And when he watered or when he ran his irrigation system, the water from the sprinkler heads was spraying into the trees on these sides of the trees where the foliage was thin. So why is that important? Well, if you're regularly wetting the needles with something like an irrigation spray, you're setting the needles up to be more susceptible to some of the needle cast infections. And so it's possible for those needles to develop a disease and fall early instead of staying on and, and having a nice full canopy um, on that tree. So the, the solution to this problem was adjusting his watering schedule for the turf uh, so that he was not running it as often and, and ideally so that these heads were not spraying into the trees. So we would keep that foliage as dry as possible. Okay, in the picture on the right and picture number two, this um, is, a, is a pretty similar situation. This um, spruce was planted on a berm and the berm was being watered by sprinkler heads uh, that were located out in the turf areas. And the, the lower branches on this tree were also getting hit by irrigation heads, uh, which was causing the, the needles to become infected and to fall. And so we had some bare branches at the bottoms of these spruce, okay? 
Here's another situation where we run into overwatering with an evergreen. Um, in this case, we have uh, trees planted for a windbreak in uh, on an acreage out in the country, and they were trying to mulch around the base of these trees to make sure that they had plenty of moisture, and they were using some grass clippings. But what we found when we did some investigation is that pulling back those grass clippings, we found that the soil was very, very wet underneath them. The grass clippings were doing almost too good of a job, and they were... Um, kind of smothering the roots of these, these trees. Uh, so the, the solution in this situation was to pull the mulch back a little bit, thin it out so it wasn't such a thick layer of grass, and then uh, address the schedule of the watering so that the trees weren't getting quite as much watering as they had been getting. But you can see in the picture on, on the left, um, th these wet conditions were causing some twig and branch dieback in these trees. And so it was definitely impacting the overall health of the trees. Now, on the right-hand picture, you know, you, you look at that tree, that spruce, and see that, okay, this, this tree has got problems at the top. We've got some dieback in the, the branches and the twigs at the top of the tree. Well, what I would ask you to do is look at that grass, okay? It's really nice and dark green, right? So this was a picture that was taken last year um, during the dry conditions that we had in 22. And so to keep their grass that green, they had to be watering this turf a lot, probably pretty frequently too. And what can happen with um, evergreens that are overwatered when we have root dieback due to a lack of oxygen in the soil because there's too much water in the soil, um, it can translate into branch dieback. And sometimes the branch back dieback is scattered throughout the tree. At, but in this case, it was it was the top of the tree. And we're gonna look here at some insect and disease problems in just a little while, um, but two, two common problems that can result in, um, in this situation that we're seeing here would be either Cytospora canker that has uh, infected the trunk at the top or bark beetles. Um, now these are not the bark beetles that we hear in the news out in Colorado. These are our native bark beetles that we have in Nebraska. They are usually not a problem unless a tree is stressed for some reason, and then bark beetles will come in. And overwatering is enough of a stressor that could make a tree like this susceptible to bark beetles. Okay, so in this both of these situations, the answer to the problem was addressing the watering and to even out the watering so that we were keeping the grass alive and looking good, but we weren't overwatering so much that it was impacting tree health. Okay. So let's go to the flip side now. Let's look at drought because we're seeing a lot of drought effects in our landscapes uh, right now. And so here in this, th these spruce pictures, um, spruces are kind of unique in that when they are suffering from drought, the needles turn this strange kind of a pinkish gray sort of a color, um, how I describe it. It's not brown. They don't, they don't often, or they, Sometimes they don't turn what we would describe as a brown. They, they turn this pinkish color. We saw a lot of this on trees in 2012 when we had that exceptional drought. Um, and we've been seeing it again last year and this year also. So if you start to see needles on your trees turning this color, that would be an indication to you that these trees are, are uh, very stressed, uh, lacking water, and it's time to get out there and, and start watering. Okay. Now we are seeing some more extreme cases too. So in both of these situations, both of these trees, uh, the, these trees are under severe drought stress. Um, and so you can see how the symptoms are manifesting in these trees. In the tree on the right, we've got extreme branch dieback. Um, and in some cases like this, with some homeowners, these trees looked relatively good in the fall. They still had needles on them. They didn't, they weren't really brown. But now coming into the early spring, what these homeowners found is that all of a sudden these branches just started dropping needles. And now at this point in the season, they're just bare like this. Um, and this is all due to last year's drought and the and winter drought and the continuing drought that we're having right now, okay? Um, and then the, the, um, the pine tree on the left um, is also suffering from some pretty severe drought symptoms. Okay. Um, okay. Sarah, there was a question that yes. popped up. Um, if 
for watering, like an Alberta spruce in a large container, um, is drip irrigation recommended? Sure, in a container situation, drip irrigation could be a really good way to water. But when we water evergreens, you know, the ide ideally we want to water deeply, but, but infrequently. So what does that mean? Well, we wanna to try to get that water down, you know, 12 to 18 inches or more into the soil. Now, and so you'll have to experiment a little bit with your drip irrigation system to see how long you have to run to get the water to go down that deep. Um, we're, we're recommending this, um, a screwdriver technique uh, for a lot of homeowners to try to estimate how deeply soil or water has gone down into the soil. Although if you have a potting mixture in this container with your dwarf Alberta spruce, the screwdriver method may not work really well for you because the potting mixture itself is going to be pretty loose and not very hard. But screwdriver techniques work re works really well in native soil because as, as um, clay soils get dry, they also get hard. And it can be very difficult to push a screwdriver into the soil if it's dry. But let's say if you're, you're looking at this tree on this pine tree on the left and trying to figure out if that's drought or, or what's happening, you could go out with your screwdriver and try to push it into the ground. If you could pretty easily push that screw, screwdriver down eight to 10 inches, then there's probably a fair amount of moisture there. But if you found that the soil was cracking or you were having a difficult time pushing that screwdriver down, then that would tell you that the soil was dry, okay? So water deeply, you know, 12 to 18 inches or more, but infrequently, which may mean maybe once a week, you know, if temperatures are very hot up in the 90s, it may mean twice a month if temperatures are in the 80s. So we're talking about how many times a month you're gonna water rather than how many times a week you would water if you were talking about turf. Okay, I hope that answers that question. Um, we sometimes can see some weird uh, problems on evergreen trees from herbicide damage. And in this, in this situation, this is herbicide drift, where particles of herbicide have drifted in the wind and have, have come in contact with the needles of this tree. And you can see how the needles have become deformed. I mean, they've curled and twisted, very irregular looking. And so anything that looks like this um, is, is uh, almost certainly a herbicide damage situation, okay? But we also see herbicide damage sometimes from products applied to the soil. Uh, and one of the common culprits for this kind of problem is Tordon. So if people are applying Tordon to kill dandelions in their lawn or to kill weedy trees, you know, they spray it on, that Tordon stays active in the soil for over a year and it can move in soil water. So as those tissues that you sprayed it on, like those dandelions, as they break down, that Tordon is released into the soil. And then if we have rain or you irrigate, that Tordon can move off site and it can be picked up by any landscape plant that you have nearby. Now, if an evergreen picks up a soil applied herbicide, they often show this odd symptom where the damage spirals up the tree. So, Hopefully you can see how the um, you can see how the damage, excuse me, the damage is kind of going up the tree in sort of a spiral pattern like this, okay? And you can see it also on this tree where the, the the herbicide is spiraling up the tree. We don't have the curling and twisting of the needles like we would have in a, a drift situation. Um, uh, we have uh, just death of the needles, needles turning brown, turning yellow or turning brown. Um, but this would indicate uh, possibly some kind of a herbicide damage symptom. Now, you might look at this and say, well, what's the difference between these pictures and the drop pictures that we just looked at? Well, if you look at the picture on the left, we still have some sections of that tree where the foliage looks pretty normal. You know, some of the, the, the branches and needles down here at the base look pretty normal. Some of the needles on the right side look, look pretty good. So it's in this weird spiraling pattern where we see this herbicide damage expressing itself. And we can see the same thing in, on the picture on the right. So this is a matter of carefully selecting the right products to use for the right uh, use as far as weed control goes. And I, I would just say I would never recommend uh, any gardener use Tordon in a landscape. Uh, the only use for that that I, I would really recommend would be 
controlling weedy trees along a fence line in a pasture where there were no trees, you know, anywhere near that could potentially pick up the herbicide. Otherwise, um, a tor a just concentrated Roundup works very well as a stump treatment for controlling weedy trees, and it does not have that soil activity that we see in Tordon. So we don't see these kinds of damage symptoms when you're using a Roundup uh, as compared to Tordon. So this is something to watch out for too. Okay, so when we have these problems with tree growth due to management issues or poor soil or, or, or things like that, what can you do to try to make the tree healthier? Well, the first thing, of course, when you're planting any new tree, you have to make sure you get it off to a good start. And so that means doing some soil prep. Uh, again, we don't really recommend doing soil amendment. We just recommend loosening up the soil. So you can hand spade it. You can um, work with a contractor to work up that soil in some way to alleviate the compaction and just loosen it to make it easier for those roots to grow into the soil. Um, it, you always wanna do that and make sure that your soil quality is good before you put a new tree in the ground. Um, there are ways to remediate that in trees that are already in the soil. And we can maybe answer some questions about that at the end if we have enough time. Otherwise, you're welcome to contact me if you have an issue with that. And um, we, we can give you some information on how to remediate soil problems with existing trees. And then optimizing the root growth. And so what, what plays into optimizing root growth are basically mulch and water, okay? So here in the picture on the left, what you're seeing is a study that was done um, where someone measured the number of roots that were growing from a woody plant. And in one situation, the tree had grass growing up to the base. And in the, the second situation, the tree was mulched. And you can see there is a vast difference in the number of roots that the tree that had mulch around the base was able to produce. So a really simple thing you can do to improve the health of your trees is to eliminate the grass, even for a short distance, even if you just come out from the trunk about three feet or so and have a nice three inch layer of wood chips in a nice flat pancake over the soil, it can really improve root growth and, and overall tree health. So that's a simple thing that we can do. Um, and then watch the water. You know, we've already talked about overwatering and underwatering. We need to make sure that we water deeply, but infrequently. And if you want to use that screwdriver technique to estimate soil moisture, that's, um, that's one thing that can be kind of a, a simple thing to do. And then, of course, scout for other pest problems to make sure that, um, to make sure that your, sorry, to make sure that you're not having other pests that are coming in that could potentially be uh, causing the tree to, to decline, okay? All right, so let's move on and let's look at some diseases. Um, so we're gonna look at some needle diseases, cankers, tip blights, and then pine wilt real quickly. Those are the, the groupings that we're gonna look at tonight. Um, so here in this picture, this is, a, this is canker. This is a cycospora canker. And we'll talk about that more, but you may be seeing trees out there right now that are showing a lot of these symptoms. And um, this is a very common problem that we're seeing in our evergreens these days. Okay, but let's start off with the needle casts. Okay, these are the diseases that infect the needles and cause the needles to shed early. Okay, so two common needle casts that we see in spruce um, there's one called Rhizosphera and there's one called Stigmina. To be honest, you don't really need to remember those names. If you were to look at the needles on your spruce tree and you see these little black structures like this growing out of the uh, stomata openings of the needle, then you know you have a, a needle cast. And there are fungicides that you can use to protect the foliage on your evergreen and keep it from becoming infected. Um, and so when, it, when a tree loses needles early due to a needle cast, uh, you know, the picture on the left is typical of what you would see on a tree like this. Now, sometimes it's a, it's a relatively minor level of needle cast. Sometimes it's really extreme, okay? But these, are, these can be controlled, right? Now, another needle infection that we see on the pines is called Dothostroma needle blight. And here in the picture on the left, you can see 
these little brown sections on the needle. And that is your infection point. That's where the fungal spore has, has come into the needle. It's killed the tissue. And here in this, in this, uh, on this needle, you see the brown point, the infection point, and then everything from that point out has died. And that is very typical of what this disease do, this disease does. Um, in very in, in uh, severe infections, then after the tip dies, the whole rest of the needle will die, and then oftentimes those needles will fall early. So again, the, the picture on the right with a very thin canopy, um, this is very likely a tree that is infected with some kind of a needle blight. Okay. Now again, a Dalthostroma needle blight can be in, can be controlled with fungicide uh, applications that are made in the spring. Uh, usually one in May, one in June, as the new growth is coming out. Um, and so remember, we have to apply fungicides to protect the tissue. Fungicides don't cure anything. So the, the needles on the left, which are already infected, we can't cure those. All we can do is protect any healthy needles and keep them from becoming infected. But if you do that and you spray the tree for two or three years in a row, then oftentimes the, the, the new growth will be protected and the canopy can fill back out again and the tree can um, look more normal. Okay. Let's talk about Cytospora canker because to be honest, we're seeing a lot of Cytospora canker right now. And um, Cytospora is a, it's a fungus and it's a fungus that enters into a branch uh, of a tree from a wound. So we see a lot of Cytospora in trees that have uh, suffered hail damage or severe wind damage, uh, but sometimes the wounds can be just insect feeding. Um, and so any kind of a little wound can be an opening where Cytospora can come in. Now, typically Cytospora is what we would consider a weak pathogen, meaning that if the tree is really healthy and vigorously growing, if Cytospora comes in and infects a point on a branch or the trunk, the tree is often able to seal that off and prevent that canker from growing and spreading. And so it can basically stop it and, and, and keep it in check. When a tree is stressed for whatever reason, whether it's planting depth or it's overwatering or it's drought, um, that's when we see cankers really taking off because stressed trees are not able to contain canker infections the way a healthy tree can. So here in the picture on the left, this is a um, this is the con color fir. And you can see this, this large section here where the bark is falling away. And we have big cracks on the side uh, where we have a, a, a pretty serious canker infection right there. And then also on this littler branch, you see where the, the sap has oozed out of that tissue. And as the sap dries, it turns white. And that is an indication that that bark right in that location is also infected with a canker. Okay, here's a couple of more pictures. So the picture on the left, you see we've got sap kind of running down the trunk and the sap is still pretty liquid and clear. So this is a new canker infection that is just getting started. But in the picture on the left, that sap has turned dry and it has become white. So this is an older canker infection that may have been there for, you know, uh, over a year potentially. Um, but when you're looking for cankers on your trees, uh, you want to look for these this sap leaking and or cracks in the bark, which can also indicate there's a canker there. So here we have just some different manifestations of how you might see canker appearing in a tree. Um, in the two pictures on the left, we've got cankers that are affecting the main trunk at the top of the tree. And so everything above the canker on the trunk is struggling and is turning brown. In the, in the picture on the right, we've got cankers on the secondary side branches. And so we've got some side branches which are dying, um, but it's all the same disease. And uh, uh, Cytospora can uh, attack a tree at any point. Okay. Okay, let's look at another uh, another serious problem on the pines, and that's diploidia tip blight. And so if you look at the picture on the right, you see we've got these little shoots that should have been our new growth for that year, but they've died. They've Here was the one from the previous year, 
Here is the one from this year, because you see we still have a little bit of green, a little bit of green here, whereas this is all brown. So diploidy, again, is another fungus. It, it affects the new growth and it kills the new growing shoots. So this shoot died last year. This shoot is dying this year. It's not uncommon in a pine to see three or four dead tips at the, at the, um, the, the very apex of a branch. Um, eventually, uh, as, as, you know, if, if, an, if a pine can't put on new growth every year because the, the, the new growth is dying from a disease, then you're still losing the older needles in their natural needle drop cycle. Eventually, you're going to end up with a branch that's very thin and has no very few needles on it. Um, and in very severe cases, as in the picture on the left, when we have a really extended infection period in the spring with a lot of rain, the diploidia can actually kill an entire branch. And that's what we're seeing in these, these uh, pictures on the left. Okay. Now, fortunately, diploidia can also be controlled with fungicide applications in the spring. So once you've identified that this is the problem, this is a controllable situation. So in the picture on the left, I would probably go in and trim off or prune off all of those dead branches and then start a fungicide spray program for this tree in the spring to protect the new growth and keep it from becoming infected. Okay. So here we're looking at pine wilt which we're still dealing with in Nebraska. We still, still are seeing Scotch and Austrian pines dying from pine wilt. And in the picture on the left, you see this, uh, this acreage. And unfortunately, all of their Scotch pines in this, in this windbreak um, have become infected and we've had a significant amount of, of tree dieback. So the really unique thing about um, pine wilt is how quickly the tree dies. Usually um, when the, um, so the, the beetles come out in the spring that move the nematodes from tree to tree. And um, as they're doing their normal feeding before they egg lay, the, the nematodes get introduced to new trees. That by the time we start to see the first symptoms, it's usually late July, early August, we'll see a tree like this one uh, starting to go off color a little bit, turning a lighter green, a little bit yellowish green, and then very rapidly, the whole tree turns brown. And, and that is classic for pine wilt. Um, so unfortunately, there, well, there, there is a control. You can protect very high value trees with a trunk injection. Um, and the trunk injection usually lasts about three years. And then you have to keep re-injecting re, uh, the tree. It's, it's effective about 90% of the time. Um, so there is a way to protect really high value trees. but it's, it's more expensive than most people want to um, uh, put into uh, for, for protecting windbreak trees. So we're seeing a lot of scotch pine die, and we, this will continue probably until most of our scotch pine are gone. But this is not a drought situation. This is, this is another disease. Okay. All right, let's look at a couple of insects, and then I'm going to wrap it up and see what questions that you have. So bagworms and bark beetles are two of uh, our very common problems that we see in evergreens. And this spruce that you're looking at here in this picture has a, a very well-established bagworm infestation um, that has not been controlled for several years. And you can see that the bagworms are really killing the branches at the bottom of that tree. Uh, they're doing so much feeding damage to the needles. So, you know, bagworms, the, the, lar the bagworm larvae are actually a caterpillar. And so in the picture on the right, what you're seeing is the male moth. And he's, he's mating with the female moth who is still partially inside of her bag. She never really leaves that bag uh, after she, she creates it. And when, once she stopped feeding and she, she is pupated. Um, so these little larvae, these little caterpillars, when they first hatch out are very small. And so you can see in the picture on the left, um, they've got their heads, you've got, they've got their heads sticking out the, the front of the bag, this little dark green, dark green blackish caterpillar right here. And he's carrying his bag around with him on his back to protect himself from predators and birds and things like that. And um, they will just move around on the branches, feeding on the leaf and, and needle tissue. And when they get bigger, uh, in high numbers, they can cause a tremendous amount of damage. 
So here in these pictures, what you're looking at are, are pretty mature caterpillar, uh, cat bagworm caterpillars. And in on the left side picture, you're seeing a, a large caterpillar. At this point, he's eating entire needles. Um, he's not leaving behind much of the needle at all. He's just eating the whole thing. Um, and then in the picture on the right, what you're seeing is just as they start to get ready to pupate, they will attach their bag to a branch with a with um, some uh, some webbing, uh, which which you can see this bagworm is producing right now. So he's going to attach that bag to the branch, then he's going to move into the bag, and he's going to pupate and become either an adult female or an adult male. Okay. So we really need to prevent the feeding that the bagworms do to prevent the damage that they cause. And the nice thing, I, I should just go back for a second. The nice thing, if you want to think about it as a nice thing about bagworms, is that they are relatively easy to, to kill or control. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis um, is a very good product. It's actually a bacteria that kills the, the larva of caterpillars like these bagworms. So it has very low impact to the environment or to birds or wildlife or other non-target insects. Um, you can find that in garden centers as dipel or thuricide. Um, so bagworms are not very hard to kill. They, they usually will start hatching out around the first part of June, but they don't all hatch at the same time. So it's a good idea to wait until about the middle part of June to make your first application so that you can make one application a good thorough coverage of a plant, and you can get a, a high, very high level of control from that one application. Okay. And bagworm populations fluctuate. Some years we have very high levels of bagworms. Other years, the populations seem to crash and we don't have very many at all. For the last couple of years, the, the population numbers have been down quite a bit. So we haven't really seen uh, the, the very high amount of damage that sometimes bagworms can cause. But who knows what this year will bring? Maybe they survived really well and we'll have high numbers again. We just don't know yet. And then our last insect that I wanted to point out to you is a bark beetle. And as I said earlier, bark beetles are a native insect. These are not the, uh, the bark beetles out in Colorado that are that you hear about in the news sometimes. Um, sometimes these are also called Ips beetles because that's the name of the, the genus, uh, their genus name. And they're very, very small. Um, what you're seeing on the right is, uh, um, uh, you, you can just barely see the head of a bark beetle right here. He's tunneling his way out of the tree and he's pushing out frass or little bits of sawdust as he pushes his way out of the tree. Um, when you look at a tree that has bark beetle damage, you might see little tiny holes in the trunk that looks like someone shot the trunk with a, with a BB gun or a shotgun. Sometimes these are also called shotgun borers or shot hole borers, I should say, because of the size of that emergence hole. Um, and when you, when you see that on a trunk, you'll see many, many of these little holes on the trunk, indicating a very high level of bark beetle activity. So the, the larva of a bark beetle is a borer, and it tunnels through the vascular tissue just underneath the bark, and it destroys that vascular tissue. So it's similar to what happens with a canker in that the vascular tissue is destroyed and the tree isn't able to move water through that section of the bark anymore. And when you have very high activity of bark beetles in a tree, they can they can seriously disrupt the, the water movement in a tree. So in the picture on the left, you see again, we have a top of a tree that is dying. And if you were able to look really closely at that trunk, at the base of the dead section, you would see lots and lots of those little shot hole emergence holes caused by the bark beetles, okay? Now, again, bark beetles can be controlled. So you can spray the tree, uh, with an insecticide. Um, you have to time it right to, to kill the adults at, at when they're present on the outside of the tree. Once the larvae are inside the tree tunneling, there's no good way to, to get at them to kill them. So we have to time the applications just right with uh, for bark beetle control. Okay. So if you have a tree like the one on the left, where you're seeing the top is die back in the top, you need to take a really close look at the trunk at the base of that dead section to look for sap leaking from the trunk 
or cracks in the trunk, which could indicate a cytospora canker infection, or you look for those a little BB-sized holes, which could indicate potentially a bark beetle infestation. And that would tell you um, how to go about helping uh, that tree and controlling the problem. So here on the left, you're seeing uh, a massive damage to the vascular system due to bark beetle attack of a tree. And on the right, you're seeing, um, uh, again, these, these little globs of sawdust that are being pushed out of the holes uh, due to the bark beetle activity in, inside the trunk. Okay. All right. So that kind of brings me to the end of my slides. And I wanted to give you some good references where you can go to find, okay, what are the ways to control these problems? So if you've got diploidia tip light or you've got dothostroma needle blight, what are the products to use and what are what is the timing of applications for controlling those particular problems? So um, the Nebraska Forest Service has put together a great series of publications um, for both evergreen trees and for broadleaf trees. But since we're focusing on evergreens tonight, they have uh, a publication called Diseases of Evergreen Trees, and they have one called Insects of Evergreen Trees. And you can find those at the Nebraska Forest Service website, or you can go to the link I have for you here, go.unl.edu slash six spruce, and you will find links to those publications there. And again, they will give you the details about what products to use, when to apply it, and all of that type of information for bark beetles, for bagworms, for canker, for the needle blights. All of that information is available there. You can also use the QR code on the screen to get to those publications as well. And then additional publications that are available on the Forest Service website, uh, things on things like uh, more on diploidia tip light or pine wilt or bagworms or tent caterpillars. So there's lots of great information there. <laughs>